Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back in this book of Ruth. There's one main lesson you're going to be taught in this book of Ruth, and it's important. In a sense, Boaz, who would be in the genealogy of uh, David's ancestors through which Christ would come, in a sense is a type of Redeemer himself. And you actually, in this book, learn the value of the legal term kinsman redeemer. And Christ being your kinsman is your redeemer as well. Now you'll remember that Ruth, though her husband Naomi's son has died, that Naomi going back to Israel, uh, Ruth went with her, accompanied her, Ruth being a Moabitess, which I mean, she was of the seed of Abraham in as much as she was his nephew's uh, daughter, uh, his nephew's uh, offspring, uh, not daughter, but offspring. Uh, and the law pertaining to Moabite men does not apply to Moabite women. So it's very legal for her. Ne- what, what is my point? Never let anyone tell you that Ruth was a Gentile. She was not. All right. Uh, enough said. And she had began gleaning in a field, and it just so happened, and I'm sure that God arranged it, that she was gleaning in, in Boaz's field. And uh, Boaz saw her, and real asked who she was, knowing she was the daughter-in-law of Naomi, which made her a kinsman. And that makes a big difference. You see, the land of this time would always stay uh, with the male, so to speak. And then as much as Naomi's husband had passed away, I have no doubt that perhaps even part of Boaz's claim had belonged to that family. Certainly it was in the same family. So there is a, a, a nearness, or that is to say, uh, a responsibility. And I think Boaz felt that. And then we noted in the closing verses that when he first saw her, they looked heart to heart, which means mind to mind, or uh, as I stated in the last lecture, love at first sight would kind of overdo it, but they were very attracted. So uh, eye to eye, heart to heart. And he had seen her um, gleaning behind the reapers, and he told the young men in his field, don't you dare touch her, because that was a thing that happened many times to the poor class when they gleaned behind reapers they were taken advantage of. And he let her eat with his uh, servants and even gave her special corn that she will have enough left over to take back home to Naomi and told the uh, reapers to never give her, make her ashamed because it was, they shamed reapers many times and many people wouldn't even allow it. But uh, he was very gracious, and um, with that having been said, as he is instructing and left word that they should not reproach her, um, he said even let a few of those heads fall down every once in a while. I think when we pick it up here with verse 6, we will uh, see that. In chapter 2, the great book of Ruth, uh, remember Ruth means beauty, and she was a beauty. uh, With a word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. And Boaz is instructing his young men, the reapers, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. In other words, own purpose, you let a few handfuls occasionally fall. And leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. Don't you scold her. And um, I, I, I want you to know, here Ruth is uh, basically a stranger in this place, Do you think it's any accident that God would have, of all the land that the barley harvest was 
that was taking place in at this time wander into Boaz's field? I think not. God had a hand in it. And God takes care of his own as he's taking care of Ruth and Naomi. Ruth primarily because of her obedience and loyalty to Naomi. Do you know that God, repre God uh, really likes that? When someone is loyal and obedient, God rewards that. Do you know, I believe just as sure as he made a difference in Ruth's life that he can make a difference in yours, in your business, your profession, whatever it is. He can, he can give us a bucket to hold our grain that's good and solid or one with holes in it where you can't put anything in it. God, when he loves you and when you are obedient and when you love him, can cause many things to happen. A lot of people call it the breaks. Well, I have a great question about that. As a matter of fact, I know, I know that God blesses those that are obedient and that love him. Okay, Boaz, uh, then back to verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. She had almost a bushel. Ephoph just falling short of a bushel, just a little bit. In gleaning, you know, that's a pretty good day's work. To beat out means, of course, she gathered the heads. In the evening, the wind would come up, when it, whereas it would not necessarily at harvest time. And you could winnow, in other words, after having beat the heads of grain, pick it up and the wind would blow away the chaff and the grain would fall into the container or usually a spread cloth of some type. Verse 18, and she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law her, mother saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. In other words, her leftover lunch was sufficient. Remember, it was Boaz himself that handed her that lunch. Uh, verse 19, and her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? I mean, here we got nearly a bushel of barley. This is unheard of for gleaning. With gleaning, you're barely able to make a meal out of it, finding a little head of grain here or there. Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. She knew someone had blessed her. And she showed her mother-in-law with uh, whom she had wrought. And she said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And naturally, Naomi's going to know this. Listen carefully. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord. In other words, she remembers the Lord, blesses him and asks God's blessings on Boaz who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Naturally, being a relative and a kinsman to Elimelech, which would be Naomi's dead husband. And Naomi said unto her, the man is near of kin unto us, one. I want you to underline that word one. I'm gonna break it back to the Hebrew for you in just a moment. One of our next kinsmen. Now, it, it is so important, and I'm going to ask that, the, that we stop a moment and analyze kinsman redeemer. If you're not familiar with it, you should be. So I'm going to ask that we have that word in the Hebrew, and it is gaal, and it is a, it's a primitive root. In other words, I mean, this is it. To redeem according to the oriental law of kinship to be the next of kin, and as such, to buy back a relative's property, marry his widow, and so forth. And it was used in other places in the King James. So that word one doesn't quite translate it, does it? Gaal means kinsman, redeemer. In other words, uh, well, uh, let's go further yet. I'm sure you're gonna have it. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Let's, let's understand the law, and we're going to start with verse five, if we may, and understand a little bit about this 
kinsman redeemer law. Now, why am I doing this? Because that's what Christ does for you. And when you see the law, which was a foreshadow of the actual to come salvation through redemption by Jesus Christ and being that literal kinsman, you get a little better feel for it, all right? Verse 5, Deuteronomy 25, and it reads, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, such as Naomi's husband had, and such as Ruth's husband had, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. In other words, she's not free to marry uh, a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. Continuing, verse 6, And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead that his name be not put out of Israel. In other words, seed would be given to the dead brother by the living brother, seven. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders, that's the judges of the city, and say, my husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Now this, this is important. It's going to come up in the fourth chapter of Ruth and you need to know this. Verse eight, to understand, verse eight. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him, and if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her. Verse nine, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And let's go one more verse, verse 10. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that has his shoe loosed. So there you have it. That is the law of kinsman redeemer. Christ is coming back to take a wife, a virgin bride in the spiritual sense. He is our redeemer, the next of kin, the one that has a right to claim that property. And all property, you know, man thinks he might own a piece of land. He might have a deed to it, but God owns it. God created it, it's all his. And generation, a man can have his name on it for a little while and then somebody else is going to. But primarily, it all belongs to God. So it is God's right and naturally the law is different today as far as brothers are concerned. And we are to always obey civil laws if it be possible. And um, certainly to the point that you would do nothing that is certainly against God's plan. Let me qualify the, that statement. But kinsman redeemer was one that was near of kin. Uh, it is not that unusual that we still go by that same law in the sense of um, life-threatening or other uh, manners of great seriousness that if someone is um, not able to decide for themselves, or even if they're ill, the nearest of kin must give the right or sign the right for certain procedures to be done on an individual. So kinsman redeemer, uh, nearest of kin, next of kin, most any document that you fill out for various reasons will ask you who is your next of kin and so forth. So there's nothing new under the sun, but it was neat that you, it was uh, neat that you be familiar, I'll speak in modern English, it was necessary that you be familiar with that law, which was a shadow of the kinsman redeemer uh, legality that Christ practices daily for those that believe upon him. All right, returning to Ruth chapter 2, verse 21, let's continue with it. Um, verse 21, And Ruth the Moabitess said, 
He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast my, by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. In other words, you stay in my field. And naturally he had told her that the young men would not bother her. 22. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. And don't let anyone catch you in another field. 23, so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. And of course, with the barley harvest and then wheat harvest, Pentecost approaches between the two. And Ruth was read at Pentecost on that day that both sons and daughters spoke. Uh, that's one reason this book is important. Now, you see, Naomi knows that Ruth and Boaz, because of the law of nearest of kin, or next of kin, that Ruth is as good as Boaz's wife anyway. By, by that, I mean, let me rephrase that in case some might misunderstand. By law of kinsman redeemer, she was already married in a sense to Boaz if Boaz kept the law. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, the thought continues. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, after the harvest, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee? Rest meaning a, a home, a place that you uh, will have security, that it may be well with thee. Naomi's getting on in years. She's certainly too old to remarry. But uh, she naturally loves this daughter-in-law, Ruth, because she had... Ruth had no reason to stay with Naomi outside of love. She could never have another son that she could take for husband. Verse 2. But naturally, the reason being uh, that she loved her. She was loyal. Ruth was loyal. Verse 2. And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? You were with them. Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. In other words, um, the night is when the wind, the breeze would come up and you always uh, beat the winnowed, means the wind, you fan and the blow and the separate the grain from the shaft and so forth. He's down there working at that and naturally, while the, um, it, the, you were near the thrashing floor, grain needed to be guarded and so forth, and uh, you stayed with it during the harvest. Three, wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, but on some nice clothes, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. Now, Naomi is using common sense here, and uh, this did not mean that Boaz was a drunkard. It was just that this was a wine-drinking country, and it was a drink that would keep. It would not spoil, such as milk or something of that nature. And uh, it was consumed with meals um, when the eating and drinking took place. But yes, they would uh, have a... That the very word of wine, yayan, in the Hebrew tongue means a warm glow as a dove coos. And um, uh, verse um, eight, 4. And it shall be, when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. Note, take note. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. You see, the marriage rite consisted of a man placing his cloak over the woman, and that was a marriage ceremony. That was it. Verse 5. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. I want you to note the obedience to Naomi that Ruth um, uh, gave. Total loyalty, total obedience. 
And of course, Naomi is a wise woman. She's elderly, wise, and she knows that again, as I forestated, they were as good as married because of the kinsman redeemer law. Verse six, and she went down uh, unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. Verse seven, and when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, uh, he was at peace with the world, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. I'm gonna guard that stuff tonight. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Verse eight. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself and behold, a woman lay at his feet. I mean, this was not, this was an open place and could be a dangerous place as far as somebody taking grain from the thrashing floor, verse nine. And he said, who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Now this was the legal right, and it's important that you understand that. Nothing wrong with it. He, it was um, his right as a kinsman de redeemer. Verse 10, and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. Uh, Boaz was older uh, than she, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. He was complimented, in other words. Inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. In other words, you stayed loyal to Naomi, you stayed loyal to the family, and um, this compliments you more than even at the beginning your loyalty just to her, that it was also to the memory of your family. Uh, she was a good woman. That's what he's saying, basically, 11. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. In other words, we, they knew her. They knew Naomi. As you know, uh, knew Naomi meaning pleasant in the Hebrew tongue. Uh, they loved Naomi, and certainly they loved Ruth because she was a good daughter-in-law. Verse 12. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. In other words, we've got a next of kin that's a little closer than I am, Ruth. 13, listen to this carefully and see the wisdom. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will, um, if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. He wouldn't touch her. He's not going, she has a good reputation, and he's certainly not going to spoil it. Now, um, how, did, how did Boaz know this? Evidently, he had already had thought about this, because instantly he knew exactly who was the nearest of kin, and whose right it was. And certainly he was a good man that he did not tarnish this woman. If he really loved her to the point that he would have her at any cost by ruining her reputation, he could have assured himself that the other kinsmen would not accept her. But Boaz would not tarnish her reputation. Now again, I must, I must keep your mind in gear to the fact, I want you to see the kinsman redeemer qualities of this. Christ would never ruin anyone's um, virtue in accepting him either. Okay, do you understand that? Take it to the spiritual so you get the clear picture. But you're being given an example, a type, 
it happened whereby you could know in the end times as it is written in 1 Corinthians 10.10 10, of what would befall you. So observe carefully. Even the very emotions themselves are important for it sets forth that type. What does he do? 14. And she lay at his feet until the morning. And she rose up before uh, one could know another. Now, it was still dark. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. In other words, he protected her. A uh, little covert activity. Well, there are times when innocency is present that a little covert activity is better than offending someone. Now understand what I'm saying. I did not say necessarily, uh, well, I think that carries its own weight pretty well. He said, don't let anyone know you were here because no doubt the kinsman redeemer that is the nearest of kin might not believe the fact that she was there with Boaz all night long and nothing happened. So Boaz is wise enough knowing she is innocent, knowing nothing did happen, it's best no one ever know this. So before anyone could recognize the fact that she was there, he sends her away and says, don't tell anyone. Of course, Naomi already knows, 15. And he said, bring the vow that the that Thou hast a veil, that is to say, a shawl, what some would call it, that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And here, I suppose, she has a reason for having been there. If someone sees her before she gets to the city, six being the number of man, and certainly the man or men that will be in the genealogy of Christ himself. In other words, um, David would come directly from Ruth and Boaz. David through whom would come the Son of God, that is to say through that Virgin Mary. Verse 16, And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? What happened? That's basically what it means. And she told her all that the man had done to her. Verse 17, And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Again, it is obvious that everyone loved Naomi and had great respect for her. And no doubt um, Elimelech as well, that is to say her deceased husband, was a very popular, well-known person. But Naomi, whose name was Pleasant, and usually a name is given to a person because of some trait that they have about themselves uh, at, at this time, and certainly Pleasant fit her well. But I like the character of Boaz here. Number one, he protected Ruth. Not only did he protect her from others, but he protected her from himself. And inasmuch as he was not a young man, he was, I don't want to say flattered, but certainly he felt the place or position of responsibility and, um, and protected her, and no doubt is praying uh, because of that first look. Again I, again, I would be overstating if I said love at first sight, but they were, uh, they, there was chemistry there, let's put it that way, and that, that would be accurate. Um, he's praying that this near kinsman doesn't want her, will not have her, and, uh, of course, we know in as much as ultimately they married that he would no doubt refuse. But I wonder if Boaz had anything to do with that. Well, I won't pre-guess it. We'll wait and see. Verse 18. Uh, then she said, 
Sit still, my daughter, Naomi speaking. Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Naomi knew men well enough to know that with this beautiful Ruth lying at his feet all night long, and Boaz well pleased with his crop harvest and everything else, not that that had anything to do with it, but I'm sure that he had fallen deeply in love with this maiden, and Naomi is a wise elderly woman. She said, I know that man, after you lying at his feet all night, will not rest today until he has this entire situation worked out and the answer is present, and we're gonna know who's who. Again, the important part for you is the spiritual type that is set forth. Kinsman Redeemer is a law that is just as much in effect today in as much as what? Who is your nearest of kin? I'm not talking about flesh now. God the Father created your soul. You are his direct descendant. As, and put, do, don't make something more out of this. Every child living, every living being is a child of God. So uh, don't, don't get on a pumped up ego trip simply because you're a child of God. But he is actually your father. Therefore, his only begotten son became our kinsman's redeemer, kinsman redeemer, because he is our father's son that is our spiritual brother and savior, kinsman redeemer. That he not only can redeem us, but as far as that's concerned, he has already paid the price for the redemption. He paid that price on the cross that I don't care what your sin, and certainly it's too early for anyone to have committed the unforgivable sin, that's why I can with a surety say any sin that you have done, that you have that door open to at least begin the plea, even if it were murder. <clears throat> but you simply with murder have to wait until you get there. Um, and I will hasten to add, because many times military personnel, because you have to uh, fight for the needs of this country, that is not murder. And um, so don't put yourself in that category. But anyway, every sin has been paid for, and ultimately that will be also, if you really, truly, from the bottom of your heart, you just have to wait a little longer to get the murder thing taken care of. That's until you face God, and he or she it was that you murdered, face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart. And then we'll see. But anyway, he, our kinsman redeemer, I might as well even, I don't know, perhaps someone needed this. It certainly I hadn't planned it, and I dislike thinking of murder in connection with the beauty of kinsman redeemer. And you might say, well, I'm his kin. Yeah, but you see, you murdered one of his kin, and he don't like that. He takes that very personal when you murder one of his own children because you're going directly to the father of that child that you murdered. I don't care what their age. And I wouldn't expect too much unless you are really a good prayer and repenter and really mean it. I would say you better get your asbestos britches on and get ready unless you are really repentant. Anyway, I just throw that in as, as recap. Kinsman, redeemer. He loves all of his children and he doesn't like anybody to hanky with them. That's why, especially if you're his elect, he will always take care of you, though you may have some tough sledding at times. He loves his children, as naturally a father should. And he's not only natural, he's supernatural. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. We'll, we'll conclude 
the book of Ruth. All right, bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? Strong's exhaustive.